Uh, my mind is still with the China house. So if you don't have a, a age cap, let me know. I definitely want to go with you guys. <laughs> um, today, we'll talk about cities of tomorrow. There are two different streams of thought on cities of tomorrow. So there's uh, one group of people, they're saying, city has been well built. We are full. Cities are too big. So we cannot build city anymore. The counter argument is that if we actually try to house all the populations of the globe, we can put them in the state of Texas. If we do a better job, for example, we build empire towers everywhere, we can put them in a city. That's like Chongqing. And if we go actually extreme, we build vertical cities, a new paradigm we're proposing, we, we can house everyone in Shanghai. Think about that, the whole world population in Shanghai. On the other hand, there's a different stream of thought. They're saying our city is going to transform. Our city will be very, very different in 50 years. With the new technology, the connected autonomous vehicle, electrical vehicle, they're not fast enough. We have a pneumatic tube. We have different ways to make city look very different. I want to pause just for 10 seconds. I want you, I invite you guys to think about future cities that you have in mind. So is your image similar to the first stream of thought or the second? So you can either take a virtual snap of that image or you can print it out. So we can talk about that later after this uh, speech. What I want to do is to invite you again to walk with me this very short virtual trip of investigating what's our urban future. So I will talk about four parts. The first part is the experimental scheme of future cities. For the people in the past, when they're imagining future cities, those are the present cities we have. So we have to understand what's their imagination, and then you can, you can compare that with your image. The second, I want to talk about the era of digitalization and the new urban paradigm. Those are based on certain uh, regulations, certain laws, and certain rules that we can build our imagination on top of it. And the third part, I'll talk about ongoing projects that may inspire you to think more about our urban future. And at the end, I'll just quickly talk about what are the opportunities for career development in urban studies. Let's go back to 1902. That's when a scholar, a, a planning scholar, uh, Ebenezer Howard, he proposed a scheme called the Cities of Tomorrow. Think about 1902. He was thinking about maybe in the 1950s, the city will look like this. So this is a scheme where they expanding a monocentric city into a polycentric city. And the size of the city is 58,000 people. How many people we have in Shanghai right now? Daytime population probably 23, 24 million, right? So this is what happens in 1902. 30 years later, another famous scholar, Frank Lloyd Wright, who claimed himself to be the father of American architecture. So he proposed another scheme called the, uh, 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 the, the broad acre city that everyone can have an acre of area, a place they can live on. What do you see in this image? What can you observe in this image? High rise buildings, at the time we don't have the technique to build. Do you see drones flying everywhere? Maybe that's just a quick inspiration or imagination in his mind. But he do that in his drawing. And the third one is based on the theory of modernism. People start to think about cities are machines. Machines have to run fast. Machines have, has to be very effective. 
So they're proposing this image as their future cities. So you can uh, actually see uh, high-rise buildings on either side and highways in the middle. I would rather call this lowways because they're lowering the highways to underground. What do you see in common of these three images? A lot of this has been realized. I hope it will be the same what you just snapped in your image of your future city will become realized in 50 years. Later on, people start to look at city at a different spatial scale. They're saying a city is not just a city, a city is a region. So a French geographer visited the uh, United States in the Eastern Shore area, and he traveled from Boston all the way to Washington, D.C. He was claiming a city is too small. The whole area is a continuous urbanized area. So he coined the word megalopolis. He started to use the megalopolis to describe his urban future in his mind. And nowadays, people start to expand this idea of megalopolis. In their imagination, they're saying cities are not only urbanized area, but on the other end of this pendulum, cities are also part of a landscape. Cities are also part of the wilderness. So we should consider both. So they start to expand. So this whole area covers the entire Appalachian Trail. It started from the Tri-State in Georgia and go all the way up to Maine. And bring this to another extreme. There are scholars such as uh, Neil Brenner. He's arguing that we should look at the global scale. This is a planet urbanism. What happens in Shanghai right now are in every way being affected or affecting lives in Africa, for example, in the Sahara. So I actually had a quick encounter with uh, Professor Neil Brenner. Uh, he actually used to taught at NYU, and then he moved to a uh, graduate school of design at Harvard University. We have a two-year overlap. I was a PhD student, and he invited me to join this project. And then I told him I just joined a, a hiking club, so I forfeit that opportunity. <laughs> now I regret a little bit. I wasn't <laughs> get involved this, in this ama amazing projects. Um, so the second part I want to talk about what are the rules and the regulations and the laws that cities are following? So these are based on a completely different understanding of our city. So our cities are not machines based on the most current scholars. They're saying cities are organic beings. So for organic beings, there should be certain regulations our cities should follow. So the first law is called the frequency law. Basically, it's saying the first, the largest city or the primary city has a certain relationship with the second largest city. For example, you know, largest city has one million population and the second largest city has half a million population. Of course, this function is not as strict as a linear relationship. The second law cities follow is the allometric law. What is the allometric law? Think about a baby. Right? The proportion of baby has a bigger head, smaller body, and shorter legs. And grown-ups, like us, we have relatively smaller head and longer legs. So this can be applied to city as well. For example, when we build a new city, we can build infrastructures, and those infrastructures will take a large amount of the early construction. But as city grow, those infrastructures start to slowly, slowly growing then the population of the city. So that's the allometric law. The third law is one of the most famous law in the universe is the gravity law. Larger cities attract more resources, more people. If you're focusing on uh, the inner side of the city, you know, the uh, transit-oriented development will attract more people towards train stations, toward attractions. Based on the, this understanding of the three laws, we notice for thousands of years, all this wisdom, all these smart people, 
be only focusing on the spatial attribute of CD. All these three laws are spatial attributes. They haven't really thought about what are the temporal dimension of urban laws. They haven't thought about what are the predictability of urban laws. So with the development of computational power and then the emergence of artificial intelligence, now we can use neurons. You can use convolutional neural network in combination with cellular automatons. All these kind of jargons, we can throw them to the existing urban data, and then we can predict what's our urban future. So after a few years, uh, many PhDs work, and we get this result. Uh, so these are you know, four scenarios. For example, the second scenario for uh, Young's Real Delta, we are saying if you promote bigger cities to grow bigger, for example, Shanghai grow bigger, uh, Hangzhou grow bigger, and Nanjing grow bigger, and the smaller cities grow smaller. So we get a 2.51% of annual growth of population. Is this what we want? Is that our urban future? So I think we have some theory and empirical evidence to support our virtual image that we have in our minds. And the third part, I want to talk about an ongoing project. We call it the urban data horizon and the platform. Um, our focus is actually the blue dot in the middle, the Yangtze River Delta area. We inherit the concept of an urban region, uh, similar to the megalopolis concept. We are focusing on an urban area instead of a, a single city. What we are trying to investigate is what are the infrastructure, what are the digital infrastructure or database infrastructure for our future city. So first of all, I don't expect uh, expecting you to read the whole thing, but the key word here is the digital transformation standard. First of all, we need to have new laws. We only have spatial laws for city. Now we need to have laws to govern the urban data that can transform our urban future. The second part, uh, this is actually going to change the name of urban scholar. Right now, I call myself urban scholar. But you know, once we establish this digital data form, we can call ourselves city doctors. We can diagnose the city healthiness. For example, if uh, we have a lot, a lot of congestion in Shanghai, we will say, mm, OK, this is a disease. This is a city disease. Maybe the figure of Shanghai should uh, uh, involve more physical education. And then if there, there are a lot of uh, air pollution, we'll say, mm, Shanghai has a lung disease. Now we need to fix this, right? So we can diagnose and then we can provide a solution. So by then, we'll be the real doctor. I don't have to tell them I'm doctor one, but actually I'm not the real doctor. I'm a <laughs> PhD doctor. Now we can be an urban doctor or city doctor. Um, once we establish this framework, we need to know what kind of data can be public, what kind of urban data we can actually share with uh, among us. So these are the very basic ideas to find a common divisor of urban data. More importantly, we need to find security for those urban data. Not only security to govern our city, but the security to, go, to govern the data collection, to govern cybersecurity, and to govern the very digital infrastructure we created. Once we have everything, we need to think about the life cycle. If city is an organic, be organic being, it will be like us, you know, baby, grown ups, and then grow older. So what are the life cycles for the digital infrastructure? If we put everything together, we'll say this is the new brain of our city. We can be the driver of this brain, and we will have a better opportunity to understand our city, to have a better opportunity to communicate with our city. 
Um, this image shows an ongoing project, as I mentioned, the uh, NYU Shanghai Urban Lab. We are trying to create a platform where not only encourage academic research, but we also try to encourage urban entrepreneurship because this is going to be a huge opportunity for us to investigate the urban future. I think today, listening to my talk, this is the right time to think about our urban future. Lastly, I want to talk about careers in urban studies. So I have students who ask me, um, so if you want to study urban, so what kind of class I should choose? So I always encourage the student, urban studies is a multidisciplinary study. You have to have a very broad knowledge. If you study social science, I encourage you to minor in data science. If you study in business, I encourage you to minor in humanity. So you need to have a broader knowledge to become a good city doctor to diagnose for the city. The second most popular question for me are coming from international students. They're asking me, so I'm not a Chinese citizen, I'm from abroad, how can I involve in this system uh, that you, know, you need not only have an academic background, but you need to have a government network. So I was, I was telling them, for you guys, it's not only to be involved in the urbanization process in China, but also you should bring this knowledge to outside through, you know, for example, the uh, Belt and uh, Road Initiative. You should exchange, you should be the ambassador to, ambassador to, to exchange such knowledge at the global scale. And also, one more question people ask me is, I want to become an urban researcher, but I also want to be rich. <laughs> How can I make money? Um, so I will tell you, the new urban data, the new data that we have could possibly replace the crude oil that we have for last century. They will become the new energy to support our future urban growth. Think about that, you know, urban data become a fortune, urban data become an asset. So this is going to be a multi-billion or even multi-trillion dollar thing that the platform we are using can become an stock exchange platform. You know, the reason that the data are staying at one company, one location, or one institution is because there's no such platform to circulate those data. So this is the second aspect. And then the last takeaway I want you to have is investigating in urban studies Think about how urban futures is a new lifestyle. It's a way that you can have a human scale conversation with our city. Thank you.